This video classroom lesson is sponsored by Transmission Bench. Visit the transmissionbench.com store for the deluxe super kit, other parts, and even the video classroom lessons used during this project. Nothing is particularly hard if you divide it into small jobs. What a timeless and inspirational statement. I think Mr. Ford would appreciate our approach to rebuilding this transmission. What could seem like an overwhelming project is really only a series of short, easy to follow lessons. Welcome back to class. This is Ford E4OD 4R100 class, lesson three. If you'll recall, in our last lesson, we began disassembly by removing a few external parts. We also repositioned the transmission upside down and removed the pan. After that, we took out the filter and the three main sections of the valve body area. In this lesson, we'll continue and finish the disassembly of this area. Removal of the three main castings exposes the separator plate and gaskets as well as this small but very important component. This is the solenoid filter screen. Rotate it while pulling upward until the notches in the plate align with the two tabs on the filter body which will allow you to pull it out. Place it into a small box with the other small parts. Use an 8mm socket and ratchet to remove the three short bolts which fasten this stiffener plate. Put the plate and bolts here. Lift the separator plate along with the upper and lower gaskets up and off of the case. If the plate to case gasket tears or remains on the case, remove it and place it onto the separator plate in order to keep the three pieces together. Turn them over and set them onto the castings which we placed into the pan earlier. Removing the separator plate and gaskets reveals what is known as the channel casting section of the case. This is probably the most intimidating part of the transmission overhaul because of the many small parts which need to be removed and saved from pockets within the channels. Let's go over them first and remove them later. All models will have a pressure relief ball and spring in this location. There will also be at least eight or as many as 14 rubber check balls in other pockets depending upon the model year you are working on. Our 2000 model year demonstration transmission, for example, uses eight rubber check balls in these locations. Finally, a small spring-loaded filter like this one will be found in this pocket only in mid-1991 through 1998 models. Our 2000 model does not use one, but I will remind you that it does go in 1991 through 1998 models later during the reassembly. Another large component you gain access to is the intermediate servo piston assembly in this bore. 
Let's discuss these parts in more detail as we remove them. We'll begin with the relief ball and spring. These two parts are actually the electronic pressure control relief ball and spring. They prevent runaway damaging high pressure if the electronic pressure control solenoid were to malfunction. Pull them out of the pocket. Set them down together in one of the boxes. The next group of parts to remove is the check balls. As I said before, removing and reinstalling them can be intimidating or even confusing because of how many there are, as well as how the number varies depending upon model year. Some models have eight, some have nine, and others have 10 or as many as 14. It's not confusing if you have the right information. You get it in the Superior Shift Correction Kit I mentioned in Lesson 1. What you need to know is included in the instruction sheets. They thoughtfully provided four pages of detailed, helpful information, including the check ball locations for the various year models. For example, as you can see, the early 1989 version requires 14 balls in these clearly marked locations. The late 1989 transmission uses only 10 balls. 1990 through 1995 models use nine. The 1996 and later models only use eight. I love this kit not only for the problem solving parts, but also for the individual easy to understand information too. Again, the 2000 model year transmission we are working on has eight. Use a mechanics pick and a small screwdriver to work them out of their pockets. I like to place them into a corner of a box as a group. If you are working on a 1991 through 1998 model, there will be a small spring-loaded filter assembly in this pocket. If your transmission has this assembly, remove them now and put them with the other small parts. The last part to remove from the channel casting area is the intermediate servo piston assembly. Early E4OD models have a cover plate and snap ring which you must remove before the piston will come out. Later models have a piston assembly like you see here, which are removed by simply grappling it with pliers and pulling out.
place it in this area of the parts bench. The last goal of this lesson is to remove the selector shaft and parking rod parts along with the parking mechanism and bracket on the rear of the case. Take a minute and get to know how the parking system works. Notice how the parking rod pushes the parking pole against the tooth parking gear when the selector lever is placed into the park position. This bracket acts as a guide for the rod. There is a spring here which constantly applies pressure to push the pole away from the gear preventing engagement when the transmission is not in park. Now let's remove the selector shaft, selector lever, and the parking rod. This would be a very easy procedure except for one thing, extracting this roll pin. In my opinion, getting this simple, small, innocent looking part out in order to slide the selector shaft out is the hardest part of working on this transmission. Let me explain. This pin is pressed into the case. It also passes through a slot in the selector shaft which prevents it from moving side to side. You have to pull it out in order to slide the shaft out. The pin is made of very brittle spring steel rolled up so that it will expand for an interference fit when pressed into the hole. It's fragile and breaks easily. It's also down in a recess making it hard to grip with a tool. You can't use long nose pliers because the tips are too wide. Even if you use a really small pair, the pliers usually just slip off. If you try pinching it with diagonal cutters, you'll only end up shattering it and breaking a piece of it off. Here's how I get the pin out. Get two small eighth inch screwdrivers. I like to use these Craftsman brand types. Make sure that you are wearing gloves and insert the screwdrivers into the recess opposite each other against the pin. You want to apply as much pressure as you can against the pin as you use the shoulder of the recess as a fulcrum as you pry the pin out. But before you do, you must dress the ends of the screwdrivers. In order for the tips to bite into and get a grip on the pin, they need to be as sharp as possible. Lightly kiss each one against the bench grinder wheel. Now they're sharp. Again, make sure that you are wearing gloves to protect your hands if they slip and hit any of the sharp edges of the case. Pry the pin out. It may only move a little bit with each try, but it will eventually come out. Set it with the other small parts. Use a 13 16 wrench to loosen the nut which fastens the inner lever to the shaft. It's a good idea to place a large socket like so in order to limit how far the lever can rotate.
slide the selector shaft out of the case. The inner lever and parking rod come out easily. Replace the nut onto the shaft and take the parts to the other bench. Place them in this area. The case to shaft seal is easily pried out with a medium screwdriver, but we'll leave it as is for now. Use a 13 millimeter socket and ratchet to remove the two bolts which fasten the guide bracket to the case. Set the bracket and bolts down onto this area of the parts bench. Pull the parking pawl, pivot pin, and spring from the case together as an assembly. If the spring gets separated from the other parts, and you are not sure how they go back together, it's okay. I'll show you how they fit together during reassembly later. Place them together onto the bench like so. This completes the removal of all parts from the valve body area and lesson three. Take a break and join me later in lesson four and we'll begin the disassembly of the main drivetrain area.